Kia ora, tēnā koutou katoa e te mana whenua ngai tua hureri, tēnā koutou. Um, welcome everybody, uh, thank you so much for being here. My name is Michelle LaRue, I am an associate professor at Gateway Antarctica within the School of Earth and Environment here at the University of Canterbury and I am more than honored and really excited to share with you a story today that is near and dear to my heart. This is a story that is more than 10 years in the making um, and came to fruition just last year in 2021 uh, when we came up with the first ever um, population estimate uh, for, for wet L seals. And so what I wanna do today is tell you a little bit of that story. I'll first start out with why do we care about wet L seals other than the fact that I happen to think they're adorable and they're very charismatic. Um, I'll talk a little bit about seals from space and what that means and how um, I almost literally stumbled upon the fact that we could actually see them from space. I'll talk then a little bit about the Ross Sea, which is also another place that happens to be near and dear to my heart. It's now one of the largest marine protected areas in the world. Um, and then to get into the kind of the real special part of it is the power of the crowd. So, so folks, uh, anyone in this room could have taken part of, of, of my research or part, taken part in my research. Um, and so that was really exciting. And then I'll finally um, end up with talking about the first population estimate and a little bit of what we learned about Weddell seals and their habitat. Um, before I begin though, I want to acknowledge the fact that uh, though I'm standing here and telling you like very vigorously what I know about seals, this couldn't have happened um, by myself at all. And so I'd like to acknowledge my co-authors who I have listed here. Um, this was work that was funded by the National Science Foundation out of the United States. Um, and it, it took um, quite literally hundreds of thousands of citizen scientists who worked alongside us, um, along with people who are Antarctic ecologists, statisticians, we had an educator on board, um, sea ice modelers, and com computer scientists to get this done. So, um, so yeah, even though I'm the one standing here, it really took a, a, a huge team effort to get this done. So I wanna start out with uh, acknowledging also that this is Antarctica. It is the highest, driest, coldest, and windiest continent on the planet. It is one and, a half, uh, one and a half times the size of the US, roughly, or, or Australia, um, and about 99% of it is covered in ice, and in some places that ice is several miles thick. It's also protected by the Antarctic Treaty, which was signed decades ago uh, by several countries who came together and decided that the entire continent should be set aside for peace and science, which to me is still a, a miraculous um, and a marvelous um, thing that happened decades and decades ago. However, the Southern Ocean that surrounds the Antarctic continent doesn't have the same types of protections that the Antarctic continent does uh, as far as the Antarctic Treaty goes. And the Southern Ocean um, has been used for its resources for quite some time. We first started uh, hunting for uh, fur seals, which you see on the left here. This is one who was yelling at me for being, I was much farther away than you look, uh, than, than it looks like, but he's yelling at me. So we were, we were you know, fishing, or in, in, excuse me, hunting for, uh, for fur seals. Um, in the 1900s, we really were, were um, hunting for whales. And then by about the 1940s, 1950s, we had begun fishing for krill, which is this smaller crustacean that you see in the right-hand corner here. And it was at about that time when, um, after the Antarctic Treaty had been signed, many of the Antarctic Treaty nations scientists kind of got together and said, you know, we've kind of overdone it in many other places around the world. We've hunted for fur seals, we've hunted for very large animals like whales, and now we're hunting for these small little crustaceans in the Southern Ocean. Maybe we should make sure that we do it correctly if we're going to continue doing this. And so in 1982, Camelar was born. And I'm only gonna say this acronym once because it's a bit of a mouthful, but it stands for the uh, Convention, or the Commission, on the Conservation of Antarctic Marine Living Resources. There are many tenets to the, the Camelar Convention, but one of the ones that I like to focus on is the fact that we as Antarctic Treaty Nations and scientists and, and those who are involved in Camelar are supposed to prevent changes to the ecosystem that are not reversible in two or three decades. So in other words, um, there's this idea that we can rationally use the resources in the Southern Ocean, such as fish and krill, 
but we need to make sure that we're looking at the entirety of the ecosystem and making sure that it's functioning the way that it should. We're not managing just for krill or just for fish or just for whales. We're looking at the entirety of the ecosystem, which is a bit of a tall order um, given Antarctica is the highest, driest, coldest, and windiest continent on the planet. It's a pretty difficult place to do some research. So that brings me to the Weddell seal, which again is this uh, creature that you see laying on the sea ice here. Um, and I want to introduce the species. So uh, what else seals are a true seal, which means you can't see their ears. Um, so if you happen to ever look at differences in seals, sometimes you see their little ear flaps and sometimes you don't. The ones that don't have the ear flaps are the true seals and the ones that do are coincidentally called ears, eared seals. So uh, what else seals are true seals they live around the entirety of the coastline um, on what's called fast ice, and that's ice that's sea ice that's fastened to the Antarctic continent. And almost everything we know about their long-term demographics, meaning how, they, how long they live, uh, what their survival rates are, how many pups a female might have in her lifetime, how deep they dive, what they eat, comes from just this one location in Antarctica called Erebus Bay. It is the location of the longest, I believe it's one of the longest uh, marine mammal studies in the world. It's been going on since 1967 and it continues to this day. And so that's the reason that we have all of this information about Weddell seals. Now, one of the things um, that I'll show you in this video here is, as I mentioned, they live on this fast ice and they, uh, they show up in the same places every year, so they're, they're phylopatric, and what that means is they come back to the same places every year, and the females will show up and they get, they haul out of the ocean using these tide cracks, and they kind of just lay out on, on the sea ice. And so I'm gonna, just gonna show you a video of what that looks like from the perspective of a seal, because who doesn't like seal footage? So this is, um, this is video that was analyzed by my PhD, PhD student, Rose Foster Dyer. Um, and she had the, I hope, distinct privilege <laughs> of looking through um, nearly 90 hours of video to see what these animals were actually doing while they were spending time. Um, and this happens to be a video of um, a mom and a pup. And the whole reason I wanted to show you this is just to kind of give you an idea of what the sea ice looks like. So that's what the animals look like as they're out um, kind of just basking in the sun on the ice. And um, if this video had video had had sound, which I'm kind of glad that it doesn't, because the pup makes a bit of a noise here in just a second, and it would it would be very obnoxious. But anyway, um, so th this is what they do: they they hang out on the ice every springtime. They start returning um, probably in about a couple weeks. They'll come back to this place in Erebus Bay, um, and they will hang out until basically the end of December. And this is what they do: they kind of just hang out on the ice, and every once in a while they go into the water. Now, one of the things that I really think is quite lovely about what else seals is that they do rely, their pups rely on their moms for quite some time, um, upwards of eight weeks. Um, and in that time, they can double their weight in the first like two to three weeks of life. Um, and by the time they are, by the time they're weaned, they're almost as, they're not quite as large, but they're almost as large as their mothers. Um, but another interesting thing about what else seal pups is that they need to learn how to swim. And this is what that looks like. So this is another video of uh, a mama seal. And you can see the pup is, I'm sure, kind of just playing around. But this is what they do. They will eventually, after about a couple of weeks, um, they'll start kind of like sticking their heads in the water. And they'll look up and make some noise and complain. Um, and finally, mom will just go in the water and just say, like, look, come on down here. And this is what they, this is what they do. They kind of just play around. Um, it's difficult to, to kind of, you know, get your whereabouts around you and to really begin to swim. Um, and so the point here is the animals stay on the ice and they really aren't going very far. Every once in a while, the mom will go in the water to do something like this. And sometimes she might get into the water to go hunting or foraging, but really they're hanging out on that ice. And that's a key piece of information for someone like me who wants to look at them from high resolution satellite imagery. hard swimming, I think, probably. Um, okay, so they hang out on the ice. They are really, really not doing a whole lot. Um, but one of the things that we do know, or one of the other things that we really do know about um, what else is, is that they eat 
Antarctic toothfish, which is the animal that you see on the screen here. So Antarctic toothfish show up on our plates as Chilean sea bass. And they play a critical role in the Southern Ocean ecosystem. Um, basically, they're, they're an important piscine predator. So, predator. so what that means is they eat other fish. And they kind of play the same role in the Southern Ocean ecosystem that sharks play in other places around, around the world. Um, and so comparatively, these animals can live upwards of 50 years. They can be two meters long. They're incredibly heavy. And importantly, they're incredibly nutritious. So if a Weddell seal can catch a toothfish, that's kind of the equivalent of, of for those of us who, who might eat meat, it's like eating a steak. Whereas some of their other fish that they go after, called Antarctic silverfish, which are maybe about this big, is like eating a couple of M&Ms or something. So the Antarctic toothfish is really this, this really lipid-heavy, um, fatty, nutritious animal that the Weddell seals need, but we also will fish for um, and, and will eat in high-end high restaurants around the world. So knowing that and uh, being not quite a PhD student um, at the University of Minnesota, one day back in about 2009, I was looking at some high-resolution imagery for something else entirely. I was making a map alongside the US Antarctic program, and I came upon an image just like this one. Um, it, was a, it was an image of the sea ice, and the Erebus glacier tongue kind of was jutting out into the ice, and I saw these little black dots at the end of the Erebus glacier tongue. And I do remember probably what my face looked like, and it was probably something like very like shock and surprise going like, first of all, confused, and then realizing pretty quickly what those were. And indeed, I was looking at what else seals hanging out on the ice. Now, serendipitously, um, the person who initiated the long-term Weddell Seal Project just so happened to be at the University of Minnesota. And also, I want to mention that that long-term project was a collaboration with uh, a University of Canterbury professor, Dr. Ian Sterling. So there's a really interesting and fun connection for me going from the University of Minnesota um, to here at Canterbury, where, where it all began. Um, and so I shared this image with Dr. Don Siniff, and he, without hesitation, was like, yep, those are, those are Weddell Seals. And by that point, I had had uh, a master's degree in wildlife science. I knew a little bit about GIS, a little bit about remote sensing, um, but it was enough to kind of hook me and get excited about doing a PhD, which is what I decided to do. So the first thing that I wanted to do was determine whether or not what I was looking at was even real, right? Like, we knew that we could see them, which is fantastic, but how useful is that information? Am I seeing all of the animals that are there? Am I seeing half of them? Is this even a you know, reliable way to understand their populations? And so we had to do a bit of a check. And so the first thing that we did um, was collaborate with the people who have been doing those surveys every single year for the past 50 years. Um, and I, the reason I have this slide up here is just to kind of show you what they look like from, from an aerial survey. They're pretty easy to see. What you're looking at here is um, probably part of the Erebus Glacier Tongue, actually. This is the sea ice. This is a crack in the ice, and all of those little black dots are, are Weddell seals. They're pretty easy to see. Um, and as it turns out, when you compare the ground counts that were happening at the exact same time as the images were taken, there's a really nice correlation between what I think I'm counting from the images and what was actually there on the ground. So what you're looking at here are a couple of different smaller haul-out locations. So Erebus Bay is huge. It's about 400 square kilometers or so. Um, and there's a very small area, sets of areas, where these animals will, will, re will reliably haul out onto the ice. And so places like Turtle Rock, Turk's Head, and Hutton Cliffs are some of those locations. And so what you're looking at on the x-axis is the date of the image, and on the y-axis is the counts. Um, the ground count is in the, the black, and the satellite count is in gray. And so the point here is that uh, at all of these locations across time, um, what I was counting from space was a reasonable, um, it was a reasonable uh, you know, representation of reality, basically. And so what that told us is that we can at least use this as uh, an index of adult presence um, around Antarctica. Which is incredibly exciting because Antarctica is huge and we don't know hardly anything about what else seals almost anywhere other than Erebus Bay and there's a lot of fast ice around Antarctica. This was, had the potential to revolutionize you know, wildlife ecology and what we know about what else seals except for there's a lot of ice to cover and math was absolutely not on my side. Um, 
as I just mentioned, there's lots of ice to cover and I am only one person. And while I love looking at the images to count seals, um, it, it, got, it got a little old. And you know, even, even if there were, say, 10 people on my team like dedicated to constantly searching for these animals, it would really take quite some time. Um, we had done a couple of, of attempts at automated algorithms to train the computer to tell the difference between uh, seals and ice and cracks and to be able to automate, uh, you know, automated, uh, automatically figure out where they are. And they worked really well. But it took longer to train the computer to find the seals than it was for me to just count them. So that ended up not really working. And so for, quite, uh, for a couple of years, that kind of just went to the side and I kind of didn't really know what to do, but I still had this passion to try to figure out how to find the seals and count them all. And that's when one day I was telling that very story to my colleague, uh, Devin Libby, at the Digital Globe Foundation at that time. And I could hear him listening patient, patiently because he had something very important he wanted to tell me and he finally let me finish. And he goes, Michelle, have you talked to Luke Barrington before? And I, of course, had no idea who Luke Barrington was, but it's a good thing that he mentioned it because Luke Barrington had just started a new company called Tomnod. And what Tomnod was, um, and it's turned into GeoHive now, so it's still in existence, um, was an online platform where anyone in the world could log in and look at these high resolution images and help find things on them. And perhaps the way they became uh, most famous, unfortunately, was, I'm not sure if, if um, Many of you remember when the Malaysian airliner went down in 2014. Um, it was a huge deal, and Tomnod was operational, and they kicked into gear immediately and got images of the southern part of the Indian Ocean where the wreckage was likely to have been. And in the course of, I think they said 48 hours, they had 10 million people looking at the ocean trying to find pieces of wreckage. And the power in being able to do that, of course, is when you have 10 million people searching a huge expanse and just finding things that they think are interesting, then what you can do as, as an analyst is look at the images and say, okay, where are people finding things? And they can really hone your attention um, so that you don't have to look, uh, look yourself over all of, the, all of the space in the ocean. And so that's exactly the kind of uh, tool and resource that could help solve this problem. And after getting rejected from the wrong, <laughs> the wrong uh, manager, the wrong um, group at the National Science Foundation, I went to the Office of Polar Programs and it got funded right away. And so the question became, can citizen scientists help us count seals around the entirety of Antarctica? And this was a really big deal and a really big question because as I had just mentioned, no one had, like I'm, me and maybe a couple other people had ever really looked for seals on sea ice before. And conversely, the people who were used to looking at Tomnod were used to looking for um, you know, results of like landslides or you know, what happens after fires, um, not really looking in Antarctica, and especially not looking for charismatic megafauna in the Southern Ocean. So uh, what we learned relatively quickly was that we needed to do the same type of thing. We needed a search area reduction. We couldn't just put out a bunch of images and hope that people would be able to count the animals. And so, if none of you have taken part in seal or no seal, you are about to. This is how we played. I hope you do well. It's really not that difficult. The question was, in this box that you see on this image, this is an actual image of Antarctica, do you think you see seals or not? Raise your hand if you think you see seals on this image. See? Nice job. Well done. Well done. Yeah. See all of this? This is a, this is a crack in the ice here. And this is, this is the white Antarctic sea ice. And all these little black dots are the seals. Very, very good. OK, next, next test. How about this one? Does anyone think they see seals on this image? Raise your hand. See? Fantastic. Very good. There are no seals on this image. What you're looking at here is, again, another image of the Antarctic fast ice. Again, that's the ice that's fastened to the continent, not out in the middle of the ocean. Um, and in this pink box here, we have the sea ice. This is a grounded iceberg. And this is the open water. OK, how about this one? And this is, a, this is a bit of a tricky one, and I will acknowledge that. I didn't have control over like the exposure settings on the satellite. I wasn't that powerful. Um, so who thinks they see seals on this image in the pink box? Raise your hand. I feel like there's maybe slightly fewer, but you are correct. There are seals in this image. Um, 
they're right here if you guys can see them. They're a little bit a little bit difficult to see, but you can certainly see them over here, right? But that was a bit of the problem, right? Was we asked people to look just in this pink box, and it's like, okay, thankfully, yes, in, in here there actually are seals, but every once in a while the pink box would, would, would be like this, and there'd be seals over here and nothing in here, and it's like, oh. Um, okay, so that's the kind of, of several campaigns that we initiated from the get-go to say, okay, we need, we need your help finding seals, yes or no. And just like everybody in this room, what we ended up finding out is people were very good at that part, which was fantastic. Um, but we knew that was going to take quite some time. And there's also, if there's any uh, geographers in the room or people who are familiar with GIS, we also had a bit of a problem thinking about projecting something at the South Pole across uh, on a web. And so we, what we ended up having to do is rather than putting the entire Antarctic coastline up for review at the same time, we had to kind of put it in sections so that north was actually up in every single case. Because um, as you can probably guess, north is up on every location, every which way um, on this particular map. And so as we were doing that and, and letting people vote for us to determine whether or not they saw a seal, uh, we had some information that we could, we could analyze right away in the Ross Sea. And this was a place that, um, as I mentioned, it's now a marine protected area. And many of, uh, of my colleagues and I had quite a bit of experience in, in it doing research there. And so it was a kind of natural place to start. And so what we wanted to do was describe what, why seals choose certain places to live in, in the Ross Sea and why do they avoid others. Um, and so don't worry too much about this graph. Um, all I want you to know here is that we found out that they don't like penguins, which for some reason, I don't, it, it's, we have a couple hypotheses as to why that is, but that's what, what B and E are showing you. So the graph in B is showing us that the presence, the probability of a seal being in a particular place is much more probable the farther away they are from Adelie penguins, which by the way, are only this big, right? And, but there's millions of them. And the opposite is true for emperor penguins, which is what you're looking at in E. Um, the probability of presence for wet L seals tends to be higher when they're closer to emperor penguins. And that makes a bit of sense because both species live on that fast ice, that sea ice that's fastened to the Antarctic continent. But we weren't particularly happy with just that. We wanted to go a little bit deeper. Um, and so this, this uh, yeah, this is just, a, it's apparently complicated uh, between wet L seals and emperor penguins. We'll get back to that in a little bit. Um, but what we decided to do was also look a little bit more closely at not just the region as a whole, but we ended up figuring out that we had to kind of sub-region the Ross Sea and have basically different variations or different combinations of descriptions as to why seals chose certain places. Um, and so as it turns out, um, a is Eastern Antarctica, so that was a whole section on its own. And then B and C, this is the southern part of Northern Victoria land. And very importantly, this is the Drigulski Ice Tongue. And the Drigulski Ice Tongue is a feature that juts out into the Ross Sea and it holds in place a lot of the sea ice down here. And so we thought that that might have um, an influence as to whether or not the sea ice holds on long enough and where the seals would show up. And so we split the northern Victoria land coastline into the southern section and the northern section. And again, I remind you that north is actually down, which is a bit confusing sometimes. And what we found there too is that there are various combinations of why seals are in these particular places. And the one that I wanted to just um, talk about real quickly is the distance to deep waters. Sometimes if you're in an area like Erebus Bay, which is all the way farther to the south in the Ross Sea, there seems to be this kind of like optimal distance to deep water. They don't want to be too close and they don't want to be too far away. Uh, but then when you get to a place like East Antarctica, they really, uh, they really need to be, um, yeah, they need to be near deep water. They're, they're just going to be ha happen to be near deep water. Um, and so that was a really interesting set of circumstances. We, we threw in some of the biotic variables, so be, being the emperor penguins and the Adelie penguins, not really knowing if that was going to make a difference, but as it turns out, um, that was in addition to the story that we weren't really sure we were going to find, and it definitely became um, something that we continued to, to go after. So as we were focusing on the Ross Sea, seal or no seal continued. And when we got the results back, we found that we had searched an area the size of New Zealand of sea ice 
alongside 330,000 citizen scientists from around the world, which completely, uh, completely blew me away. Um, but the real thing that, as I was looking through all of this data, was the fact that there were only, seals were only present on less than 1% of the ice available to them, which was completely shocking to me. Because prior to this, um, a lot of the population estimates were assuming that, kind of assuming, that um, what else seals, if you counted a, a certain number of seals in an area, you could just kind of multiply by the amount of ice available, and that's roughly how many seals you would get. So that the idea is that they were uniformly distributed around the fast ice in Antarctica, and that is certainly not the case. They're not available on very much ice, and they're very patchily distributed. Um, but the one thing that I do want to mention that I alluded to earlier is that people really liked finding seals. Um, and we over-identified seals really, really great, but we're really, like a lot, which is OK. Um, but and very importantly, we didn't miss any seals. I went through and checked over 20, 21,000 maps on my own in addition to doing the searching myself. And there was only three instances where there was a seal in a um, in a pink box where people had voted that there was not. So the false negative rate was very, very low, which means you, we can deal with that. I'd rather, I'd rather go back and count areas where there may not be seals rather than missing a bunch. Now getting back to some of the um, pieces of information that I provided at the, at the beginning about seals and their biology, and this is why it's really important to really be thinking about the species, um, be thinking about their ecology, why they do what they do, what they're eating, um, because we had to use that information to be clear and certain about who we were counting and when we wanted to do our counting. So because seals are phylopatric, meaning they come back to the same places uh, very reliably every year, um, that means that we know when we should be counting them, so in November's, and it, knows, it means we know who we're counting, which is reproductive females. And so we can really narrow down and isolate exactly who we're counting on the imagery in November and come up with a very clear and certain uh, estimate when we come up with such an estimate. So that's exactly what we did. So after we had all of these areas, we really narrowed down our search area to less than 1% of the ice to go back then and count, that's exactly what we did. We said, okay, you guys helped us out and found you know, a bunch of places where there are seals. Now we're gonna go back to those places and actually count them. And this is an example of, of what that uh, functionality looked like. This again is the fast ice. Um, these are icebergs, grounded icebergs. And around those icebergs are those little black dots and those are all seals. And so this process was slightly different than the search area reduction. It still relies, or it relies as well on this crowd rank um, algorithm, which is consensus based. So the idea here is that for every person who tags a particular feature, the more people who agree with that person or agree that there's a, a feature is actually a feature of interest, the more likely it is to be that feature. So in this case, the more people who are clicking on this animal and this animal and this animal, the more likely it is that those are actually seals. So it's the wisdom of the crowd. The more people who agree, the better. And again, just another example of what that actually looked like. So again, we showed images where, where people had um, searched for seals, found them, and then we said, okay, please go through and place a marker on every single seal that you see. But how does that work? Because very reasonably, uh, there aren't very many people in the world, well, prior to this anyway, there weren't very many people in the world who had been looking for seals on ice. Um, so how do we know who is good at this? How do we know who, you know, who might not be as good at, at this? Um, and then again, this is where CrowdRank comes into play. It's this algorithm that Tom Nod uh, created and again, it's this idea of the, crowd, the wisdom of the crowd. And so I'm just gonna explain real quickly how that works. So imagine, if you will, there are three different maps, like kind of like those, those boxes. Um, there's maps one, two, and three. And a guy named Jim comes along. He sees each of these maps, and he thinks he sees a seal on every one of them. Then you have Beth. And Beth comes along, and without knowing who Jim is, or even knowing that he has seen these same maps, she sees the same three maps and agrees with him on maps one and two, 
but doesn't think she sees anything on map three. And then Todd comes along, and he too does not know Beth or Jim, but he does see the same three maps, and he completely disagrees with both of them and tags something else entirely on map two. Now with only this information, there is very little power to determine which, which of these features is actually a seal. Like Jim and Beth did, you know, they agreed on two things. Todd saw something else entirely. It's kind of on either side of 50-50 as to whether or not any one of these features is actually a seal. But when you have hundreds of thousands of people looking at these images and you have upwards of 20 people per map, all agreeing or completely disagreeing with particular features, you can really start to narrow down and say, okay, it's probably fairly likely that on maps one, two, and three, Jim did a pretty darn good job, and poor Todd, poor Todd saw something else entirely, and no one agreed with him, and so the likelihood that that feature is actually a seal actually decreases. Furthermore, the more people agree with you, your crowd rank score goes up. And so as, as you're doing this over and over again, and having more and more people voting on lots of different maps and having people agreeing and disagreeing, you can really start to sort out not only what are the features, but which counters or which taggers you can kind of trust to figure out um, where the seals are, are living and where they're not. So we had thousands of tags. There were lots of crowd rank scores, but now what, right? That's that's great, but there was a, a much bigger statistical problem waiting for us that I did not foresee coming. Um, it, what, what it turns out is, and I'm not gonna get into the statistical modeling, but uh, what we ended up having to do was yet again, not only trust, we couldn't trust the crowd rank scores themselves, um, we had to correct for the bias and then calibrate those counts. And so effectively what that meant is I had to go in um, as the expert um, and, and what we ended up doing was saying, okay, as, as best possible, Michelle will do probably as good as, as anyone could possibly do, looking for seals on, imagery, on the imagery. And so uh, we said, okay, who agrees with me? And we will use those taggers to help create some of these models. Um, and the reason we had to do this is because even though lots of people were agreeing with each other, they were still agreeing with each other on things that weren't seals. They were tag happy, as we would, as we would call it. Um, and so what we ended up having to do was say, okay, we know people are overcounting. We need to shrink it down to what I would count, and I always undercount, and then we can reinflate it to what was actually there on the ground at that time. And the reason we could do that is, again, because we had uh, a collaborative relationship with the people who were actually on the ground counting all the seals all the time. And so we had a lot of image comparisons to make. Um, and in many cases, we had exact dates where a ground count happened and we had an image, and so we had a really, really nice tight relationship um, to make those comparisons. And so really, the, the, only, the point I wanna drive home here is that the wisdom of the crowd was really great, but it wasn't quite as reliable as we had hoped. Like I said, we still had to go through this iterative process, and that kind of dragged out our um, our results a little bit longer than we had hoped, but we finally, finally got there. And for the first time ever last year, uh, right around this time actually, um, we found that there were about 202,000 breeding female Weddell seals as of November 2011. How's that for a bunch of caveats? We had to be very, very specific because we knew, like I said, we know exactly who we're counting, um, and this is as of 2011. And a few things that I'll um, want to point out here is that the Ross Sea, this area that is now a marine protected area but was not in 2011, contains 42% of the world's population of Weddell seals. But when you go just to the east in the Amundsen Sea, there's only about 10 to 12% of the world's seals there. So there's a really divergent um, pattern in two kind of neighboring regions in Antarctica. The other thing I wanna point out is the fact that the 202,000 estimate that we came up with is one quarter of the estimate that was previously suggested in the literature. Previously, when I was talking about like, oh, counting the seals and kind of just roughly estimating how much the ice there is and then multiplying it out, was about 800,000 Weddell seals, and we now know that there's far fewer than that. So even though that's quite a bit of a difference, um, 
I do caution to suggest that that's a decline. We don't necessarily know that that's a decline. What I would say. species um, ever. And interestingly, higher global uh, scale in Antarctica, white seals still don't like to be nearby emperor penguins, and they still don't like to be nearby Adelie penguins. And so that's a really interesting uh, pattern that has held at multiple spatial scales. So still not, still not really a penguin fan, and we're going to try to figure out why that is. Um, but I think just to kind of summarize and to finish up here, one of the, one of the things that I really learned from, from this project was not only all kinds of things about wet L seals and computer science and statistics, which was a really enlightening and engaging project for me as a scientist, but what it did was it put me in touch with, with hundreds of thousands of people who were interested in looking at the same little black dots that I was interested in looking at. And so it was really engaging. We had an online forum and people were sending me messages and asking me why they weren't seeing seals and you know what is this brown splotch over here and they were finding things like the the real idea about exploration sitting behind a computer or sitting on your in, in your chair at home at night like that's such a cool thing to me um, another thing that I thought was really great was it was very democratizing you all could see the same thing that I see. This isn't a, I'm gonna go, you know, go away and count a bunch of images and you trust me. This is, hey folks, let's all do this together and you can see what I see. And I was really hoping that that in some small way would perhaps increase a little bit of trust in, in scientists. And as I mentioned, it was also this idea of exploration. We had all kinds of great online forum discussions about what people were looking for and what they were finding. Um, and as I mentioned, I got way too many messages about, I've seen 400 maps, why am I not seeing seals? I was like, I don't know. I'm sorry, I'm not really sure. Um, but probably the most um, inspiring thing for me uh, as a scientist, and, and this is the, the, the slide I really like to end with on many of my presentations, is because it reminds me why we do this. So this is a picture of a young lady who happens to be the daughter of a friend of mine from high school who I hadn't talked to since high school. And she heard about our project on the radio as they were driving home from school one day. And she got so excited that she could go see seals on images and help a scientist do her work um, that my, my friend from high school took a picture of it and, and sent it to me and wanted me to know that she was so excited and inspired to do this work. And that was a really inspiring thing for me to know that her work, no matter what she did, actually helped us do this work and, and, and to better understand a species that she may never see in the wild and many of us may never see in the wild, but just to know that she can actually make a difference was really inspiring um, and it's also a really great reminder as to why we do this because I don't want to live in a world without Weddell seals and I don't think any of us probably do. Thank you. Questions. I just wondered if you were able to see other seal types like Ross seals or, or you know, um, leopard seals, other seals that. Yeah, so we know that we can see uh, crab eater seals um, on, on the images. The ability to determine the difference between leopard seals, crab eater seals, and Ross seals will be a bit more difficult. So just a little bit more context, there's four ice seals in Antarctica. The, the Weddell seal is kind of the easiest one to start with because we know where they're about to be and they, we know at the time of year. So kind of any of them could be in there at any time. So the vast majority probably of the seals that we find in the pack ice are gonna be crab eater seals though. So that would probably be the next one. The others might be a bit more difficult. You've been spotting um, uh, breeding females. Uh, what about males? Where do they go? That's a great question. So uh, where do the males go? So uh, the males at that time of year are under the ice defending their underwater territories. Um, and so the, again, the power of combining the ground counts and that, that work 
with our stuff is we were able to double check and make sure like, okay, so we come up with a stable age distribution for the population and make sure that our correction was, was right and it was, it was spot on. So roughly 10 to 20% of the animals that we would see on the ice on any given day are gonna be males. The, the rest are gonna be under the water. Thank you for the presentation, that's, that's fantastic. Um, I'm just wondering about the citizen scientists. Can you say something about the age distribution or is it more younger folk or older or is it, do you know about the age? So I, I have an idea roughly about who um, the, the general, um, I guess, age distribution and people who would log on to Tomnod, the, the people who gave that information, we have a little bit of that. So it tended to be um, people who were retired um, and it tended to be people, yeah, so it tended to be retired people a lot. And actually there was a few folks, there was like a handful of maybe 10 to 20 who were kind of these super, super taggers and they were like these reliable people who built a relationship with Tomnod and they knew them and they would <laughs> email each other back and forth and stuff. Um, so there, there was a really skewed distribution of a, like very few people who did a lot of tagging and then the rest were kind of all over the place. But for our particular project, we don't have that, that information. Excuse me, sorry, I, I think I missed one point. You said the crowd wisdom is reliable or unreliable? It's unreliable, so, unfortunately. So does that disqualify all the uh, election result? <laughs> no comment. <laughs> is there a question up there? Uh, thank you for the great talk. Uh, what's next for you and your Weddell seals? And the second question, are anyone around the world doing something similar with other animals now? Yeah, so the next step now is to um, move beyond the snapshot in time. So we, um, thankfully, we were, we were thinking <laughs> as we were putting this together and we thought, okay, well, while we have people's attention, let's try to get them to look at as many images as possible. And so that's what we did. And so now we have a time series of all of the animals. And so that's the next step is to figure out how the populations are trending or changing over time. Um, and we're starting in the Ross Sea because now it is a marine protected area. Um, as far as other animals, the thing that's really exciting is this is possible with lots of other species, particularly in remote areas. So for example, if you go to Maxar, I think it's maxar.com, um, and you go to GeoHive, you'll see a walrus from space, and that's some friends of mine from the British Antarctic, and they're doing the exact same thing. They're asking people to come in and, and count walrus from space. Um, you can do this with albatross. Uh, there's folks who are doing research on elephants. Um, and so, Actually, walrus and elephants are probably a lot easier to see because they're much, much bigger. Um, so yeah, it's a really exciting time to kind of have this idea that you know a lot of these these species are really difficult to track on foot or to put you know, even put collars on. You can actually see um, just by flying a satellite over. So it's really exciting. Quick oh, sorry. Here and then we'll go over there. Yep. Are you thinking of applying the results of your research back to those computer algorithms you were talking about earlier? We, uh, so some colleagues of mine have, have done that, yes. Um, and the results, are, I think, leave a little bit to, to, for, for room for improvement. Um, they're about 30% accurate so far. Um, it is probably one of the things that I personally, as, an, as a non-computer scientist, I find fairly baffling. Like, they're just little black dots on ice. I, I don't understand why this is difficult, but it really is quite, quite difficult to train a computer to tell the difference between seals and melt pools and rocks and cracks and things like that. So yes, but I think we're still a long ways off from having a reliable way to um, enumerate them. You could probably detect them because you can detect cracks in the ice and then see if there's seals around. But yeah, there's a lot of work to do still there. Yeah, a quick question to show my ignorance. When you talk about fast ice uh, that's attached to the uh, to solid ground, how does the tide crack affect that? And do they use the tide crack to actually get out and haul out onto the ice? Yeah, so um, thankfully I've got a sea ice expert here, and so I might ask him to correct me if I'm wrong. But um, 
And the way, so the, so the, the tide cracks, at least in Erebus Bay, tend to form in the exact same spots. So there's, these, there's like um, parts of the islands or parts of the, the glacier tongues that create the cracks. And so when the tides go up and up, it'll, it'll literally make a crack in the ice. And so that's where they tend to be year after year. Um, and yeah, literally what they do, what the females will do is they will gnaw on the ice, like you know, move their heads back and forth and they will keep these holes open. Um, and in fact, that's how the males, they just hang out there actually all through winter time. They'll just keep these holes open in the ice and just hang out there and, and breathe. Um, it's amazing to me that they don't like not like gnaw their teeth down uh, sooner than they do. Uh, but yeah, so they keep keep the they, they maintain their tide cracks and come in and out as they need to. Any other questions? You're using visual um, imagery. Why, why can't can we use infrared? I mean, they'd be warm and everything else would be cold. But I guess we don't have satellite technology down there in infrared. Uh, so my, uh, in theory, yes, um, but I, I asked Digital Globe that question and they kind of gave me a cagey answer and I feel like it's probably possible but not for civilians. <laughs> um, I got the answer that, well, that's not possible, it, it takes too much, there's too much of a payload or something, which I will take, I will take that answer, but... Um, yeah, exactly, exactly, as soon as, as soon as the SEALs start reporting to the CIA, we should be good to go. Yeah. Any other questions? Well, if not, I'll be here for a few more minutes afterwards. Thank you all very much for, for coming. Um, and if you have any questions, of course, feel free to come talk to me now or uh, reach out to me by, by email. Um, I'd be happy to talk with you. Thank you so much.